أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. and his immaculate progeny of Ahlul Bayt, especially the leader of our time, the ultimate savior of humanity, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Farajahu Sharif. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. The Almighty God states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Al-Ladheena yubalighoona risalat Allahi wa yakhshawnahu wa la yakhshawna ahadan illa Allah. Wa kafa billahi hasiba. Sadaqallahu al-Aliyu al-Azim. Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. <coughs> In every society, there is a dominant group. This dominant group controls power in several ways. One of the ways in which dominant groups have power and exercise power in society is by controlling the material resources in that society, by having material power. They will control the wealth of that society, the natural resources that are found in that society. Do you know that 2%, the top 2 wealthy percent of the world's population control over 50% of the world's wealth? 2% of the people have a great share of the world's economy. They control more than 50% of the world's wealth. Americans, when you compare them to other nations around the world, they are the most nation that uses natural resources. Political scientists and economists, they say that if everyone around the world want to li live like the 300 million Americans live, then we need seven planets of Earth for them to be able to do that. That's because many Americans, the, re the amount of resources that they're using is far more than what they actually have here in this land. They are exploiting other nations and using the resources of other nations for their own comfort, for their own economic lifestyle that they have maintained. This is one method in which Dominant groups exercise power by controlling the resources in a society. The second more important method that dominant groups use in order to control society is called ideological power. The power to control the minds of people. The power to influence their perception. Ideological power is so powerful and is so effective that successful dominant groups can effectively shape public opinion. Even the way in which you think about the world, even in the way in which you perceive the truth is altered by ideological power, is shaped by this ideological power. And one of the ways in which dominant groups exercise ideological power is through the media. The media plays a very powerful role in influencing our opinions and in influencing our thinking. To give you a glimpse of the power of the media, let's start with the history of media here in the United States. 
In the 1950s, dominant groups came to the realization that through media they can control the minds of the masses. You can tell people how to think, what to think, through the process of giving them news and information. You know, before the 1950s, news companies pretty much gave you raw news. They simply laid out the facts. They laid out the events that take place in America and around the world. There wasn't much analysis. You were just given the news and it was up to you as a citizen to analyze the piece of information for yourself. But in the 1950s, everything changed, especially when the TV was introduced. The first broadcasted, mass-produced film in the United States or TV coverage in the United States was performed in 1948. That was the first time that now these images were broadcast to millions of Americans. In 1950s, the news that was given to people wasn't simply news, raw news that you yourself look at, you analyze the facts, and you come up with your own opinions. News corporations began to do the analysis for you. They began to do the thinking for you. So they present to you the news, then immediately, as many of you have seen, especially in our modern times, this has really become excessive. What you hear today from channels like Fox News really is not news. It's probably 10% news and 90% analysis. They bring a so-called expert and he convinces you to believe that piece of information in a certain way. They do the analysis for you. For decades, the American population have not been thinking about global events, even about domestic events. Because these news corporations have shut off the thinking process of an average American. An average American right now doesn't need to think. You come back from work, you know, you go, you have your dinner. After having that nice meal, you sit on your comfortable couch, you get the remote control, you turn on the TV, and you begin to watch these channels like CNN, especially channels like Fox News on your cable provider. You don't have to analyze anything. They'll give you the piece of information. They'll analyze it for you. They'll bring a panel of experts. You just listen to what they say, and then you go back to bed. This is the daily routine of an average American. The average American doesn't sit and think about what's being given to him. He or she doesn't reflect on the type of analysis that is given to him. And what's worse than that, the average American believes that the information he or she receives is completely fair and balanced. It's unbiased. Isn't that the motto of channels like Fox News? Fair and unbalanced news. Fair and balanced news. Unbiased news. They keep on you know, stressing the point that this is fair and balanced so that the average American believes. Whatever Fox News says, it's as if Jibra'il, the angel of God, has said it. They accept it wholeheartedly without really challenging it, without really thinking for themselves. But this didn't always exist in history. It was in the 1950s that we see the media really shifted in its focus and in its goals. And this has had a huge impact on the minds of the average Americans. To give you a few examples, I think it was in 2010 or 2009, voters were polled, they were interviewed about climate change, you know, about global warming. 45% of these people who responded, these are Americans, 45% of the respondents, they said that global warming and this climate change is bogus. It doesn't exist. And scientists have proven that there is no climate change. Because of, its, because of the channels, because of channels like Fox News, these poor Americans really believe that. They don't realize that such media corporations have their political agenda. 
There are political groups who want Americans to think that there is no climate change. Why? Because these people are in charge of the oil. They don't want any new types of energy. They don't want you to invest in new types of energy because they want to continue making money off oil. When you talk to them about the carbon monoxide and the pollution and how the ozone is being destroyed, they'll ignore that. They'll deny that. And they will make people to believe that this is all false in order for them to keep their companies and keep their positions. This is just one example. Another example, my respected brothers and sisters, which is the focus of tonight's topic, is how Muslims have been portrayed in the media. Do you know that recent polls have revealed that over 50% of Americans have a negative view of Islam? They view us negatively. They view Muslims negatively. Not positively at all. And it is because of the role of media in presenting this dark, nasty image of Muslims. Another aspect of the media that we need to keep in mind when we analyze the role of the media in our society is that the media, you would think the goal of a media corporation is to give news, right? Isn't that what they claim? Our goal is to give you fair and balanced news. But that's not really the goal of a media corporation. Today these mega media corporations, the number one goal for them is to make money. They're business-oriented corporations. Do you know that in 2010, Fox News, they made a pure profit of $700 million. How do you think they made this so much money? They've turned it into a business. The goal of every news channel and news corporation is to increase its ratings, to get the highest number of viewers. And they're very good at it. The way they do so, the way that the media has been in large successful in getting so many viewers and in making so much money is by creating a threat. They create a threat for you and that's how they keep on attracting you to their coverage. The media has recently, especially after 9-11, in order to increase its ratings, make more money, and fulfill its political agenda, the media has created a new monster. That monster, no, it's not Freddy Cougar. No, it's not Godzilla. No, it's not Bigfoot. The new monster that the media has created after 9-11 is none other than the religion of Islam. They have created a monster out of this faith in order to get more viewers so that you remain loyal to their coverage. That's the nature of a human being. Ask a psychologist and he'll tell you. When you threaten someone, when you put someone under fear, that person will tune into you, will listen to what you have to say. That person will take everything that you say seriously. And this is exactly what the media has done here in the West. By creating this threat out of the religion of Islam, their goal is to simply increase their ratings, get more money and get more number of viewers. In order to achieve its goals, the media uses three very important strategies in order to become effective, in order to have a role in society, in order to shape public opinion. And I want you to think about these strategies. So the next time you turn on the TV, you are aware of what the media is doing and how the media is changing public perception. Because the media definitely does that. You know, an employee from Fox News a while ago, she admitted, this employee in Fox News, she admitted that on a daily basis, they receive instructions, you know, from those above them, from their managers, from their supervisors. They receive instruction that when you present a piece of information, don't just plainly present it. Give it a twist. Make sure that the way in which you present it meets our requirements, is consistent with our agenda, with our political views. And in order to do that, the media uses three strategies. 
The first strategy, my respected brothers and sisters, and please listen to this carefully, the media personalizes every story. What does that mean? Whenever the media presents a story, the average viewer thinks that he's getting the full story. He's getting the full context in which the event happened. But that is rarely the case. The media always gives you one angle of the story. They never present you the full picture. They don't give you all the background because they don't want you to see the entire background. They only give you and present to you the angle that they would like you to see. Because by presenting one angle, they can influence your opinion. To give you an example, we always hear in the media that the country of Iran bans, uh, has forced the hijab, the veil. These poor women in Iran, they have no choice but to wear the veil. This is oppression. This is against the rights of women. We always hear that in the media. But honestly, I ask you, how many times have you heard in mainstream American media anyone talking about Turkey and the fact that Turkey bans the veil? In Turkey, if you want to go to a public school, you want to go to court, you want to go to a government building, as a woman, you are not allowed to wear the hijab. You can't enter with the hijab on. Either remove it or don't enter. Now I ask you, aren't these, from their perspective at least, shouldn't these be equally the same from the aspect of human rights? What is the difference between forcing a woman to observe the veil and between forcing her to remove the veil? Is there a difference from the aspect of human rights? From the aspect of human rights, there is no difference. But you always hear about Iran, but you never hear anything about Turkey. Have you hear someone from Fox News criticizing Turkey? Why do you ban these women? Freedom. Freedom means let everyone do whatever they want. Why do you ban them from observing their hijab? Isn't this injustice? And by the way, I'd rather have someone force me to wear something than someone to force me to remove my clothes or not to wear something. It's more of an insult when you force someone to remove something. It's great insult to, that, to the dignity of that person. But you never hear about that because the media personalizes these stories. It only gives you one angle. It never gives you the other angle. Another example is how the mainstream American media considers the religion of Islam as a religion which oppresses women. And one of the things they always use against Islam is that you separate between men and women. In your gatherings, women sit in one hall, men sit in one hall. But you never hear about the Jews in New York and this completely segregated synagogues that they have. Have you heard about that on Fox News or CNN? That in New York you have these synagogues in which women are completely segregated. There are synagogues in which women are not allowed to enter. You never hear that about. You never hear about that in the news, do you? Because they don't want to present you that angle. They just want you to know that these Muslims are backwards people and they're oppressive to their women without even presenting you our perspective. You never hear about a Muslim's perspective. Why is it that we separate between the genders in our programs? You only hear from their side, from their angle. When it comes to the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu <clears throat> alayhi wa the media for years now has launched such an evil campaign against the Holy Prophet. They give you the impression that this man was a man of war. This was a man who spread everything by the sword. This was a man who had no mercy. And you see them quoting verses from the Holy Quran, which talk about fighting, you know, which talk about killing. And they take these verses out of context. They don't give you the context. They don't give you the real meaning behind these verses. Because if you want to take things out of context, why go to the Quran? Go to your own Bible. Go to the Bible and see the verses that are contained in the Bible. You can easily take verses out of context in the Bible. But can I come out and say that Christianity is a violent religion? That would be an ignorant statement for me to base that on a single verse in the Bible. But you see the bias that exists in the media. To give you an example, 
There is a verse in the Bible in Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 to 35 in which Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, supposedly said this. Listen to what Prophet Jesus has said in the Bible, in the current Bible that exists today and I'm quoting the exact words. Prophet Jesus supposedly said, do not think that I have come to send peace on earth. You never hear that about in the media, do you? What does he say? I did not come to send peace, but a sword. I came with the sword. I am sent to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. According to this verse in the Bible, the mission of Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, was not to bring peace, but to bring a sword, and to cause trouble in one's family, to make a son against fa his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You know, as if we don't have any trouble between daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws. Imagine a prophet coming and instigating. They don't need to be instigated. They're fighting anyways. Another verse in the Bible, in Numbers chapter 31, verses 17 to 18, supposedly Prophet Musa salam said this he says now therefore kill every male among the little ones Prophet Musa is teaching his companions how to invade a city and to kill every male every male among the little, little ones and kill every woman who has been with a man so every married woman should also be killed but the girls who have not been with a man spare for yourselves take them for yourselves these are the words in the very Bible. But the media never talks about this. They only go to the Quran, pick and choose verses here and there, and give you this nasty image that Islam is a, religions, is a, is a religion of violence. And they paint this nasty image of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that he was a man of war, he was a womanizer, he was a man who took advantage of women. We Muslims, we have to be educated enough in order to respond to these allegations, to these false accusations. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was a man who brought dignity to women in that time and age. Until this very day, the Prophet's teachings, peace be upon him, give dignity to every woman around the world. You know, you would think that the Prophet, peace be upon him, the number of wives that he married, the Prophet peace be upon him, married them in Medina. You would think, you would tell these people, if the Prophet peace be upon him was a man, you know, whose goal was to fulfill his desires and get as many women as he wanted, why didn't he marry in Mecca? In Mecca he had a better opportunity. That's because when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, declared the message of Islam, the pagans came to his uncle Abu Talib. They told him, oh Abu Talib, go to your nephew, go to Muhammad and give him our message. Tell him, please stop practicing Islam and stop preaching the religion of Islam and we'll give you whatever he wants. We'll give him whatever he wants. If he wants to be our king, we'll make him our king. If he wants money, we'll make him the wealthiest man in Mecca. If he wants women, we'll give him the most beautiful women of Mecca. Abu Talib, he took the message, he brought it to the Prophet. The Prophet told him, my dear uncle, go tell these pagans, if you put the sun in my right hand, and you put the moon in my left hand, at the expense of renouncing my mission, abandoning my mission, I will never do so until I die conveying it or I see that it prevails. If the Prophet peace be upon him was a man who looked after his own interest, a man who wanted to fulfill his desires, he should have taken that opportunity without any headache, without any trouble, just be a king and have all these women around you. That wasn't the goal of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet, when he married these women in Medina, the Prophet was demonstrating a lesson to the Muslim community. Two of the women that the Prophet married were from the people of the book. Safiya was a Jewish woman. Maria was a Christian woman. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was bringing unity to his community. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was teaching Muslims religious tolerance. 
Because you know the people of the book at the time, they were conspiring against Muslims. The Christians and Jews in Medina, they gave Muslims a very hard time. And because the Muslims were harassed by them, they grew angry and they wanted to retaliate. The Prophet told them, no. The one who has not harmed you, you have no right to retaliate against them. And in order to demonstrate to them practically in society, the Prophet married from their tribes. And the Prophet ended the bloodshed between the Christians and Jews and Muslims. And you say that this was a man who wanted to fulfill his interests. By the way, one of the legends and myths that till this very day, non-Muslims believe in, and even many Muslims unfortunately believe in, was the fact that the Prophet, peace be upon him, married Aisha at the age of six. That's a myth, my respected brothers and sisters. Simply take a quick look at history. Just do a mathematical calculation about the year in which Aisha was born and the year in which she married to the Prophet. And you see that this is a false hadith. Aisha married the Prophet, peace be upon him, when she was at the age of 17 or 18, not the age of 6 or 9. This is something that our scholars have demonstrated by analyzing history, by analyzing the sources of all, of all Muslims, not just our sources. The problem was Aisha, she had this habit of exaggerating about her qualities because she wanted to give the impression that she was the most beloved wife to the Prophet. She wanted to demonstrate to Muslims that the Prophet was desperate for her. So he couldn't wait and he had to marry her at the age of six and the marriage was consummated at the age of nine. These are false accusations against the Prophet, my respected brothers and sisters. A simple look at history and the history of Aisha when she was born, when she married the Prophet, the day in which she died, how old she was, a simple calculation will reveal that she was 17 or 18 at the time when the Prophet married her. So this is false that the Prophet married a six-year-old child. The Prophet never did such a thing. The Prophet was a wise man who received his instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet was a man of peace. And he took every opportunity to bring peace to his society. So one of the first strategies that the media uses is to personalize every story. They don't present you the full context. They only present you the angle they'd like to see. Another very important strategy that the media uses in order to shape public opinion and influence the thinking of people, especially Americans, they dramatize every story. They present you a story in such an unusual way, such that it really turns into a drama. Now this is especially the case when it, when it comes to presenting news about Muslims. The image they give you of these Muslims, these barbarians, these people who are not patriotic, these terrorists. Whenever a Muslim does something, even if it hasn't been proven, immediately you see the headlines. A terrorist Muslim man does this. A terrorist Muslim has the intention of doing this or that. But if a white man, non-Muslim man, commits a crime, perpetrates an attack, they're called these poor insane people. At court they bring someone, a doctor, a psychologist, and they confirm that they're insane. So Muslim, subhanAllah, so it's something, it's, it's in their genes that they can't be insane. There is no insane Muslim on the face of the planet. Only these other people are insane. When Timothy McVeigh, the Christian white man who committed those heinous crimes in Oklahoma, in which he bombed a building and he killed close to a hundred people, immediately, for those who remember the event, immediately on the news, and this was before 9-11. Immediately on the news, everyone started to say these Muslim terrorists have plotted against the U.S. society. And then it was revealed that it had nothing to do with Islam. Just a while ago in, in Oslo, in Norway, when the attacks were perpetrated, for 10 hours the news and the media were talking about Muslim terrorists who committed the crime. Then 10 years, 10 hours later, the truth was revealed. A man who had nothing to do with Islam, in fact a man who despised Islam. 
and despised Europe and despised humanity. But you see no one labeling him as a terrorist. If you're not a Muslim, no matter what, you can wipe out the entire population of a city and you're still not a terrorist. You know, you're just... The most thing they'll call you is a criminal. They'll call you psychologically ill, mentally disturbed. They've got all these words for them. But the minute that a Muslim does something, immediately you see the word terrorism. And this is one of the ways in which the media dramatizes its stories. They present you this evil image of Muslims. They tell you that these Muslims are untrustworthy people. They're terrorists and they want to take over the world and especially America. We as Muslims, we need to educate ourselves, my respected brothers and sisters. And we have to know how the media functions in our society so that we can dispel these misconceptions. Many of you are aware of the controversy that occurred in France about banning the veil. How much did the media talk about banning the veil? Now from the way the media dramatized the events, you probably think there are these millions of Muslim women in France you know, who are scaring and spooking people in the street with their veil. Do you know that in the entire country of France, there are only 360 women who wear the veil? The full veil, the burqa in which they cover their face. 360. All this chaos and all this hype in the media because of 360 women in a nation of, I don't know what the population of France is, 50, 60 million. You can see how the media takes events out of proportion. Who cares? Let 300 women wear the veil. How is that a threat to your society? And you channel all this energy and all this talk about 300 women. There are more important events in society. There are more important events in the world. There are people dying every day because of disease, because of poverty. Talk about them. Not poor 300 women who live in a country of millions of people. But that's how the media does. The media, their goal is simply to dramatize events and stories, to present this negative image. And they have been successful. Because recent polls, as I mentioned, reveal that over 50% of Americans carry a negative image of Islam. You know, they say one day, this guy was walking in Central Park in New York and he saw this little girl playing in the park when suddenly a dog starts chasing her. So he sees that the, talk, the dog is attacking her so he goes to save this little girl. He holds the dog, you know. He protects the young girl from being bitten by the dog. At that moment the police, they rush to the scene. They come, they ask what happened. And they, they tell him that this guy saved this little girl from being bitten by a dog. So the chief of New York police, he comes, he shakes hands with this man. He tells him, congratulations, you're a hero, you've saved this little girl. Tomorrow, you will see on the headlines of all newspapers, a hero from New York has saved the life of a little girl. So the guy, he looks at the police, you know, he smiles, he tells him, I'm sorry, but I'm not from New York. He says, that's okay. Tomorrow you will see an American hero saves the life of a little girl. He tells him, you know, I, I apologize as, love as, I lo I, as much as I love America, but I'm really from Bangladesh. He tells him, you're from where? He says, Bangladesh. He says, he takes out the handcuffs. He handcuffs him. He says, let's go. Tomorrow you will see on the news this headline that this Muslim terrorist tried to kill a dog in in, in Central Park. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is the second strategy that the media employs and uses. The third strategy is for them to normalize these stories, which means that they take these events and stories and they relate it to American core values. You know, to, to the idea of freedom. And they tell you these Muslims are against freedom. To the idea of democracy. And they tell you Muslims are against democracy, against equality. And the Americans, they interact with such, with, the, with such concepts. When you tell an American that someone is, 
here to take down your constitution, to take away your freedom. Of course, this American will feel threatened. And once they feel threatened, the media has achieved its success. The media has got what it wants. One very vivid recent example that demonstrates how the media shapes public opinion is the famous McDonald's story. Many of you are probably aware of the story in which this poor old woman, you know, spilled the hot coffee on herself and then she sued McDonald's. Now the average person, when they look back at the story and they remember this incident, what does the average person think? The average person places the blame on the woman. The average person says, oh, this irresponsible lady, she burns herself and she goes and sues them. Isn't that what people think? Most Americans, that's how they understood the story. And people were against her. People did not sympathize with her. You take responsibility for your own actions. That's because McDonald's, through its influence, through its economic power, it infiltrated the media to present the story from one angle. This woman was, her name was Liebeck. Her last name was Liebeck. One day she's leaving McDonald's with her grandson. He's driving, she's in the car. She, she wants to drink the coffee, so she's trying to open the lid when accidentally she spills the coffee on her lap. At that point, her, her grandson sees that she's burned. So he takes her to the hospital. When, the, when her doctor, when her surgeon inspects her, he tells her, what happened to you? The burn is very severe. She tells him, I, was, I got some coffee from McDonald's and I spilled it. The doctor was in shock. He says, really? Coffee can have such severe burnings? This is very unusual. Never in my career have I seen you know, a hot liquid, whether it's coffee or water, that causes such severe damage to the body, such severe burnings. So after she recovers, she writes a letter to McDonald's. She, t she requests two things, a very polite letter. She tells them, listen, first of all, I ask you to reduce the temperature of the coffee maker, and by the way, these days when you go get coffee, you know, it's so cold, <laughs> there's no heat in it at all. She says, reduce the temperature because I was severely burned. I don't want anyone else to be in danger as I was in danger. Secondly, my doctor has told me that the temperature was unusually hot. And this surgery that I underwent to recover my health cost me $20,000 and I don't have the money. So I ask you, because my doctor told me that you increase the temperature to an unusual degree, to an excessive degree, I ask you to pay for these expenses. That's all she asked for, $20,000 and reduce the, the temperature. McDonald's was waiting for such a story because they take advantage of such stories. They give it to the media and you have this huge, you know, circulation of news about this woman who's suing McDonald's and then this lawyer comes to her, he tries to help her and they sue McDonald's because McDonald's refused to even reply to her. They didn't even care about what she said. So she sues McDonald's for a million dollars. Of course, she doesn't end up getting that money. She ends up getting about 200 or so. But the media doesn't tell you about these events and details for one reason. That's because corporate businesses corporations here in America, they don't want to see, be sued by people. You know, people suing corporations cost them a lot of money. And there's a lot of injustice that goes on. There are many people who have legitimate claims, they have legitimate concerns, they come up to a corporation, trying to sue that corporation. McDonald's and companies like McDonald's, they wanted to close the door on the average citizen from bringing their claims to court. So what did they do? They took advantage of such a story, they dramatized it, they personalized it, so that they give an impression to Americans that if you ever hear about someone who's coming to sue a big corporation, know that the person is really to blame, not the corporation. Right now, if let's say McDonald's really oppresses someone, and that person goes home, he tells his family, he tells his friends, you know what, I want to sue them, because they have denied me my rights. You know what they'll tell him? They'll laugh at him. They'll tell him, oh, you're like that old woman. 
who spilled the coffee on herself, who injured herself, and she was crying she wanted money from McDonald's. Sociologists say McDonald's has been so successful through this coffee campaign that they actually managed to reduce the number of claims against them. And that was by using the power of the media. The media, my respected brothers and sisters, carries so much weight in our societies. One of the recent threats that has surfaced in the media is this other mini monster called Sharia. And many of you have heard the word Sharia circulating in the news. They talk about this Sharia as if it's this, you know, the spider crawling in American society and it's creeping, it's coming, it's getting us all, it's destroying us all. And most of them have no clue what Sharia is. Believe me, if you ask these lawmakers who are so, you know, passionate about trying to ban Sharia in the United States, they have no idea what Sharia is. To give you an example, in Alabama, a reporter asked a state senator, who was trying to ban Sharia in Congress. He told him, Mr. Congressman, can you tell us, can you please tell us what Sharia is? You know what his reply was? This is his exact words. He says, I don't have my file in front of me now. He doesn't know what Sharia is. You would think, come on, at least if you're trying to ban something, at least you should know what it is. At least you could summarize it in a few short words. You can at least tell the people, your citizens, your constituents, what you're trying to ban. He says, my file is not in front of me. In another state, in Nebraska, a reporter asked another state senator. He told him, what is it about Sharia that's troubling you? Why do you fear Sharia? Can you explain to us? And these are his exact words. He says, I'm not in my office to look them up. He's not in his office to look up the fears of Sharia, the dangers of Sharia. And this man is trying to pass a bill to ban Sharia without even knowing what Sharia is. Recently, Terry Jones, you know, this pastor who burned the Quran, he went to Michigan and he was asked there, why have you come here? He says, I've come to protest Sharia law. They told him, can you explain to us what Sharia law is? He says, oh, I'm no expert on Sharia law. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They create this threat, and then they try to ban Sharia, and then they tell the American society, oh, we've saved you from this threat. So vote for us. We saved you from this threat called Sharia. Otherwise, they have no clue what Sharia is. And all these lawmakers, by the way, for your information, who have come up with these bills to ban Sharia, they have not written it themselves. The New York Times recently published an article exposing who the real man behind all these anti-Sharia bills is. This man is a man from Arizona, a far-right extremist man in Arizona who considers all Muslims his enemies. His name is David Yerushalmi. This man is a lawyer. He's come up with all of these laws and he simply sends them to these state, you know, legislators. And they think as if something has come to them from heaven. They go, they scare their people. And then they say, okay, we're trying to ban them. Once they end up banning the Sharia, they tell their citizens, we've saved you from this monster called Sharia. In order to increase their popularity, in order to increase their votes. Constitutionally, it is against the Constitution. It is unconstitutional to ban Sharia law. And there are many lawyers who are working to get a decree from the Supreme Court of the U.S. to specifically state that banning Sharia law is against the Constitution. The courts in America are allowed to use other sources of law, such as canon law, such as Jewish law, such as Sharia law. But these people have not even understood what Sharia. What is Sharia? Just ask any American who's afraid of Sharia. Ask him who's even tried to implement Sharia law here in the U.S. Sharia in Arabic simply means a legal code of conduct. There is no religion on the face of earth without Sharia. You can't have a religion without Sharia. Sharia simply means the laws of your religion. Christianity has Sharia. The Ten Commandments, that's part of Sharia. What is it about the 
Islamic Sharia law that these people are so afraid of? And who in the U.S. has tried to apply Sharia for them to ban it? But you see, they bank on people's fears. They bank on people's fear in order to achieve their own political agenda. And that's why they've created, you know, this monster out of Sharia. We as Muslims, my respected brothers and sisters, we have to learn from these experiences and we have to know where our responsibilities lie. We have to be educated about our faith and we need to fight ignorance, not with a gun, not with war, not with tanks, no. With knowledge, with education. The best way you can fight ignorance is through education. Through your kind and compassionate words, through your akhlaq, through your morality, through your behavior, through your manners. That's the best way to demonstrate to American society that Muslims are peace-loving people. That Muslims are patriotic citizens. We have a hadith that tells us the love of your land is from iman, from faith. The believers have, the believers have love towards their land. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam in a beautiful hadith he says khayru al-bilad ma hamalak la ma hamalak he says the best nation the best land is the land that carries you that provides opportunities for you not the land that burdens you and takes away the opportunities from you we need to demonstrate this to American society and this is a religious obligation because the 8th Imam of Ahlul Bayt peace be upon him in a very beautiful hadith Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad he says rahimallahu abdan ahya amrana may Allah have mercy on a person who revives our teachings and traditions faqultu lahu fa kayfa yuhyi amrakum the companion asked al Imam al he told him how can we revive your teachings? The Imam told him, He learns our knowledge. He learns our teachings. After learning our teachings, he takes these teachings and he spreads it amongst the people. He educates people. I swear by God, if people know the beauty of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, the Imam is saying, if they know the beauty of our teachings, Teachings, the pleasantness of our teachings, the compassion behind our teachings, the whole world will follow us. But if the world has not followed them, it is because of us. Because we have not delivered their teachings properly. It is our obligation here in the United States to fight ignorance with education. Voice your concerns. If you don't voice your own concerns, if you don't get into journalism, if you don't go into the media, no one's going to care about you. No one's going to fight for you. No one's going to stand up for your rights. We have to ask for our own rights. It's an Islamic obligation, my respected brothers and sisters. Let's never forget that. It is beautiful that in our communities we have many doctors, you know, many engineers. You know, they say if you're Khoja, you end up becoming a doctor, a dentist. If you're Pakistani, you'll end up becoming an engineer. If you're Lebanese, you end up owning a gas station. That's all good. It's good to be part of the economic fabric of our society. But to every society that I've been to, believe me, rarely have I seen a Muslim in the, in the field of media, a reporter, a journalist. Why? Why have we abandoned these fields? We shouldn't complain when we are misrepresented because we have not made the sincere effort to represent ourselves. If you go and represent yourselves, people will heal the real story. I can't count on others to represent me and voice my concerns. It is an obligation that we become active in the media of our society. We can start small and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support us if we support Him. The Prophet peace be upon him in his time he gave so much attention to the idea of media and he would send one of the Muslims to every tribe, to every village to educate them about Islam, to dispel the evil accusations of the mushrikeen. We're not doing, we're not doing that here in our societies. Let's, let's encourage ourselves, let's encourage our children to go into journalism. Every community needs 
Many Muslims who can represent them well, who can speak before the media, who can be in the media making decisions there. There is freedom to an extent, my respected brothers and sisters. I'd be foolish to sit home and say, oh, no one will let me speak, no one will let me voice my concerns. That's not the reality. The reality is if I make the sincere effort and I have tawakkul, I have reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will see some results. وَأَنْ لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى The Quran says, and لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ You shall not achieve anything but through your own efforts. I can't sit home and expect others to do things for me, to do my own obligations. Let us take this as a lesson, my respected brothers and sisters. Yes, the media has oppressed Islam. The media is biased towards Islam. And they have been successful in negatively shaping the views of Americans against Islam. But that all demonstrates that first of all, I haven't been doing my job. And secondly, I need to do something from now. From tonight, make a commitment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I will try my best to educate others about my faith. Show others the beauty of your faith. Show others the beauty and tranquility and peace that exists in the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam is a religion of unity, is a religion of brotherhood. It's a religion in which no racism exists. The Prophet, peace be upon him, abolished racism in his society. Till this very day, America suffers from racism. Yes, peoples of other races are probably not publicly killed because of being people of color, but there is still racism alive in our societies. Let's share these teachings with our fellow Americans in this society. Doesn't our Imam, peace be upon him, state, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created heaven for the one who obeys him even if he's an Abyssinian slave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created hell for the one who disobeys him even if he's a master of Quraysh, even if he's a prominent noble man. In Islam, there is no room for racism. Because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the best amongst you is not the one who's white, not the one who's beautiful, not the one who has more money. No. The best amongst you is the one who has taqwa. akramakum atqakum. The best amongst you in the eyes of Allah is the one who has piety. The one who is humble towards other people and the one who serves his society. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all to the straight path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the motivation, the inspiration to represent ourselves here in this land. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins. We ask the Almighty God to always show us the truth and keep us away from falsity. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure all those who are ill. Let's pray for those brothers and sisters who are suffering from any type of illness. Let's ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer their prayers. I ask you everyone together, raise your hand in dua and recite this holy verse five times. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Everyone together. Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha ad'a. Amman yujibu al-mudhtar idha ad'a. Wa yakshifu al-suu. Amman. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَ إِذَا دَعَا وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ نسألك اللهم باسمك الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات 
نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة تسبقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد